です。There is a massive change happening, isn't there, in business? And I think we're witnessing it here today with what's happened with Cooper Parry. Your brand is not your logo. What is your brand then? Let's get that out the way. I define brand as the meaning people attach to you and your offer. So I'm a, an ex designer, right? A graphic design. And、uh, I used to get so frustrated with people when they used to just say, oh, just create me a brand, Matt. Just create me a brand. And、uh, what they meant was they, they wanted a logo, some fonts, some colors, a little booklet,、um, and they wanted basically a veneer, a lick of paint. And I don't think licks of paint are good enough anymore. I never did, actually. But I think even more today, now, licks of paint do not work. What we want is truth, what we want is authenticity. And what we want is meaning. So, brand, the meaning people attach to you and your offer, is a much more helpful definition of a brand than a logo and some fonts. And culture is so closely aligned to the meaning people attach to you, right? Because your people, they're on the front line, they're the ones interacting with, with, with the customer. And so, the meaning people attach to you from a customer perspective has to be inside the very people. That, that you employ. all right? So, the, the scary thing about the definition that I've just given about brand being the meaning people attach to you is that what that says is you don't actually own that brand because it lives in the hearts and the minds of the people that are perceiving you. It's in the eye of the beholder, right? So, That is a scary thing. So, you've got to kind of think of it from that perspective. You don't own it, but you, you, you kind of can, can do certain things to help get that meaning out there, to get the right signals out there. And culture is one of those really, really key things. And these things don't happen by accident. You know, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I rarely say this, but that was a, this is a tough, well, there's a tough act to follow, right? When you've got Aidan April on the stage, because these, this is a business at Cooper Parry that actually is, is living. And breathing the things that they profess. And so, my, I'm here to champion that for all of you guys who are running businesses right now. Don't just say it, do it, lean into it, because that is going to be the future of business, I'm sure. Anyway, I, I digress. Brand is the meaning people attach to us, and I've got because of culture, because of the behaviors, customs, and beliefs of our people. There's a great little book called Great Mondays by a chap called Josh Levine. Great Mondays, I'd recommend it. And he talks about designing your culture. And he gives a definition, which I think is fantastic. He says our culture is the cause and effect of all of the decisions we make. The cause and effect of all of the decisions we make. From, from somebody on the front desk, someone in your, in your retail shop, somebody who answers the phone. Right up to your CEO, all of those decisions create a culture. And, and so you need some, some sort of new North Stars, you need some guidance, you need some help. What is our culture? And, and, and it doesn't happen by accident. You know, Aid was talking about, you know, it was very deliberate. So this is the game I'm in branding, which is the attempt, the very big attempt to manage meaning. It's tough, it's hard. But businesses really need to get to grips with this. You know, in business, I think we're great. At setting goals from a financial perspective, from a, you know, from a turnover, from a sales, from a. I know I'm in an accountancy firm, so I've got to be careful what I say about numbers. But, you know, we love numbers, don't we? But when it comes to the more emotional things, the more creative things, which are becoming more and more and more important, we find it tough to change. We find it tough to really think, well, who are we? Why are we here? Why should anyone care? And that is where brand comes into play. So, when you think about it, your brand as a collective group of people and touch points and offerings and experiences, it speaks a certain way, it dresses a certain way in its design, it behaves in a certain way, it sources its materials from certain places, etc. It does things for us from a consumer perspective. It exists on the basis of a set of beliefs, and I think that one is becoming more and more important. And all of those things come together. Into your audience's mind to create a meaning, whether they will buy or whether they will not buy, whether it feels right and whether it feels wrong. And this is even more important when we, when we come to consider culture, because 
these, all these things apply to attracting talent to your organization. We've heard about attracting the best talent, the top talent. If you want the best people who are right for your organization, you need to know who they are and what they believe, and if they believe the same as you. All of those, the, the brand should flow through absolutely everything. It starts at the heart with the culture, with your people, and then it goes through your products and services, your customer experience, and then finally, the lick of paint on the end should just be that. It should just be, this is us, and this is how we, this is how we are. So that's, that's how I see it. I'm gonna hear, I'm here, that was a bit of a preamble. Bear with me. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm already getting the eye. So, I wanna share with you some actual takeaways and stuff that you can maybe start to think about applying in your own organizations. So, I wanna share three tools we're going to rapidly go through them. Storytelling, design thinking, and agile strategy. These are, are kind of buzzwords, but I'm going to try and make them really simple for you and hopefully sell them a little bit to you in terms of the benefits of them. And then I want to sort of share with you three ideas, three strategies that you could then take these tools and apply to each of these three things. Aligning your leadership, enhancing your employee experience, and embracing innovation. These are, are really crucial things. So, are we ready? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Right. Tools. Okay. Just so we know we are. I just thought I'd make it super big. <laughs> number one. No, big number one. Storytelling. Okay. So if brand is the meaning people attach to us, and branding is the attempt to manage that meaning, how do we create meaning in our organizations? How do we even as humans understand the world around us and, and kind of create meaning about ourselves? And the answer is stories. That's the simplest thing. When you boil it all down, brands are just stories like people. We're all just a story if you think about it. When you think about it as you grew up, how did you make sense of the world around you? Through stories, through little storybooks, but not just that, through your cultural story, through your religious story. And, uh, and, and the psychologists actually tell us, and I think this is really interesting, that all of us have kind of like a self-written story that we write, probably from a quite early age, of ourselves and our lives, okay? It's kind of like, we might not know it, but we do. We kind of have an expectation of where our life should go. And when stuff in life kind of is on track, we feel happy and, and you know, we feel content. But when something in our life doesn't fit with our self-written story of how things should be, we're discontent. And so we look around for stuff. We look around for things to help us with our identity, to get us back on track, to reinforce our story. We look, at, we look for other people. We look for brands, in fact, that we can, that we can borrow bits from to, that says something about us so that we can live into our own story. So stories are really, really important. And so this goes from a consumer perspective, but also from an employee perspective. Like if I want to work for an organization, I want to make sure that it reflects what I believe in my self-written story. Like, there's certain organizations that I wouldn't work with because it just wouldn't feel right for me. There's others that I would. And so this is how it works. So, quick uh, little book to share. I love sharing books. Um, anyone heard of this guy, Joseph Campbell? He, um, he's really interesting. He wrote this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. This is a, a, a storytelling um, kind of phenomena that he uh, coined the monomyth. It's a typical storyline that happens in all stories, okay? And if this is how we kind of see the world around us and even ourselves in that story, you know, we can start thinking about it from, from our employee experience and also our customer experience. And I think as businesses, we need to zoom out a little bit. Sometimes we look very much, we think the world's all about us. And so we look at the customer journey and we say, this, you know, someone wants to come into, into contact with us and then we do this and then they go and then we forget about them. But the truth is, I think we need to zoom right back out. We need to look at people in their life stories, and this is a really interesting way of thinking about it. Like, who, who are our customers? Who are our employees? And ultimately, what do they want to become? How are they going to become stronger after interacting with us? So, let me just show you this. So very, very simply, there's three acts. Act one, there's this, uh, the character, he's in his, his or her ordinary world, and then there's some sort of calling, uh, but they don't have the skills, they don't have the knowledge, so they, they have to go to a mentor. They get the mentor, and then suddenly the adventure begins. They depart from the ordinary world. They go into a special world. There's trials. 
there's all sorts of problems, there's this major crisis that they have to overcome, but then they overcome it and they, they get some treasure, there's a result, and then they return back again to the normal world that they came from, and uh, everything is lovely, but it's different because during the journey, they've learned something new, they've become stronger, they've changed, and that is ultimately what it's all about. Stories help us as humans deal with change, and as brands and the businesses, we are trying to get people to change somehow. We're trying to help them, their lives be a bit better. So why would we not take this and use it from a customer perspective and an employee perspective? That's my challenge to you. And here's the key thing. If this is the journey of our customer or our employee, employer, an employee, who are we in this story? And so what I like to encourage business leaders to do um, is to think about themselves and say, well, you know, are we a character in our customer's story? And if we are, which character are we? Which part do we play? Let me just give you a very brief example. Let's say a business sells their glamorous object, which is a drill bit, right? Now, you could say, you know, I'm selling drill bits, guys. You want to buy a drill bit? And, you know, probably not. Why? Why would you want to buy a drill bit? Well, you want to buy a drill bit because you want to drill a hole, okay? So you could say, well, actually, we are selling holes, right? We're selling the results, okay? Everyone's like, well, that doesn't feel that great, does it? The truth is, is what are we actually selling? We're selling the ability to do things like put up shelves. So we're selling, are we selling that? Are we selling that end result, you know? But actually, no, I would say that what you've got to do, when you want to dig deep into a, into a customer's story, you're not actually, why are people putting up shelves, right? They're putting up shelves so that they can look at their partner and say, Hey, I put up a shelf, and they're like, yeah, you're awesome, you put up a shelf. And that is the feeling that you get at the end, right? So, so don't sell the drill bit, sell that emotional feeling right at the end, and drill down deep into the whole customer journey and what it makes the customer become, and uh, ultimately uh, how they'll feel right at the end. As I say, the customer has got to become the hero in your story. We're a character in, in, in their story. One other quick thing, I'm a big fan of, I'm not going to have time to go through them all today, is, is, to, work, is to look at archetypes. Archetypes are like typical characters that pop up, pop up in stories. Um, first uncovered by uh, Carl Jung and defined as patterns of behavior that we as humans kind of associate with. Anyone heard of Carl Jung? Oh dear, scary. Hopefully no psychologists in the room, because I'm not a psychologist, by the way. But this is really deep rooted in psychology. It was, his, his work was used by Margaret Mark and Carol S. Pearson and in this book here, The Hero and the Outlaw, and they applied it to brands, what, they, what, what archetypes do is they live here in our deep, collective unconscious. And when I just reference these briefly, you'll see you'll kind of associate with the meaning without me even having to go through it very much because that's where stories lie and the characters in stories lie. Here they are, here's 12 of them. The explorer, the lover, the jester, the creator, the rebel, the magician, the hero, the caregiver, the innocent, the sage, the citizen, and the ruler. Now, these are a powerful tool, I would say, to rethink your business, like in a more emotional way. Like, which one are we? Which, uh, and, and what I do is with leadership teams, I often sit them down and split them up, and suddenly I'm, uh, you know, you say, well, which archetype are we? And everybody thinks we're something different. And I say, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Because we're trying, we're, we're all pulling in different directions in the story we're trying to tell, and therefore the meaning a customer gets is going to be really confused. I just want to pull out one. The rebel, you are here today probably because you have somehow connected to the rebel archetype, which is Cooper Parry, disrupt, lead, make life count is what they stand for. In fact, it was nice to see Abe when he referenced that, that, uh, that news clipping that said they're the rebels of accountancy and they're proper living into the rebel archetype. As he said, you know, what do typical accountants do? This, we want to do the opposite. That is a rebellious, a rebellious thing. And, and a lot of the customers, I imagine, of Cooper Parry, are, 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 they want to change things. They want to rebel against the norm. They want to grow. And so if they were in, a, in, a, in, a, in Star Wars, they would have been Han Solo, I would suggest. So 12 archetypes um, which are, are useful. They help us to manage meaning by telling better stories. Now, the rest are going to be a little bit quicker because I realize I'm way over time already. So sorry, I'm going to be quick. So the other thing is, is how do we make things better through... I would say through design. These things don't happen by accident. And so design sits between where you are all today now and the future. 
You've got to design your way there. It won't happen by accident. We've got to be purposeful. Typically, we've been solving problems in business by what we know and what's always been. And then we've kind of just done a bit more on the basis of what we've already done. But the truth is, we need a new way. And this is where design thinking comes in, because it adds this new little thing called make, which is where you play with stuff and you test it out and you trial it with customers and you really inject new innovation into the market. You open up your, your potential possibilities, you, you narrow down on a, on a problem and you open up on solutions and then you deliver that and then you repeat. But you, in this middle stage here, you're testing it. So by the time it goes to market, you've got customers in the room, people know what's going on. You get them all together. And that's the, uh, the third tool, agile strategy. Agile is a lovely buzzword. I use it, in, in essence, to help people collaborate at speed. You know, we, it's, it, we've got to move fast in today's day and age. And this top-down kind of waterfall processes, which businesses have been used to working in, is not working. It doesn't mean we can't move quick enough. There's bottlenecks all the way on every step. What you need to do is get the right people in the room and, and, and short bursts of energy around key problems to solve them. So I always suggest, like, get the leaders in a room. Get, get a customer in there. Get, get people who are on the front line in there and innovate together. And if you, apply, if you do that, you can design with people, not simply for people. By the time you go to market, you know it's going to work. So using those three tools, you can really design and tell stories and create some meaning throughout the whole of your organization. So strategies, three. Number one, align your leadership. It was interesting to hear Aid say that, you know, that was one of the key things that the leaders of Cooper Parry wanted to do. They wanted to get, they had a vision and they were all aligned to it. This is quite a simple but helpful tool to ask a leadership team. Why do you exist? What's the purpose and the beliefs, other than making money, for this organization? How are you going to do it? What's the mission? What are the values? What are the guideposts as you attempt to fulfill your purpose? What are you actually offering, ultimately? And this is the most important one, I would suggest. Who are we doing it for? And why should they even care? When you think about the values, we heard from April earlier about the values, I think that was absolutely fantastic because when you just operate on specific rules if an issue falls outside of those rules people get lost they don't know what to do but if you have values if you've got a culture of values then when an issue uh, arises outside of that and you allow your people to make decisions they can start operating around those values which means a better customer experience so that's number one you've got to align the leaders and you've got to give pe people permission you've got to Really think about your employee experience. New buzzword, EX, employee experience. We love buzzwords with an X on the end. UX, CX, EX. Um, some of my work is, yeah, careful with how you go with that. Um, <laughs> some of my work, um, quite interestingly in brand, has been adopted a lot by HR uh, kind of teams. You know, brand typically has been the, the role of marketing. Right? Here you go, this is kind of like a, isn't it a logo and some fonts? Let, let's leave that to marketing, right? But the, the thing is, is then HR are like, well, we've got to kind of go out on social media and we've got to try and attract talent. But marketing are like, no, brand is mine. Um, you can't have anything to do with us. And so the two don't talk. But the truth is we've got to unify the whole thing. It's got to, you've got to think about it from, from, from a holistic approach. You've got to really consider the whole experience from an employee perspective if you want to retain and attract the top talent. We're doing a very bad job of it. Um, we mentioned Gallup before. This is... Uh, this is a study they did a few years ago. 41% of employees um, who know that their company, what differentiates their company brand, only 41% of them knew. That means about 60%, if this is you know, something that we can take as a rule, 60% of your employees won't know why you're different. So we've got a problem. We've got to start working on brand inside so then it reflects itself outside. How are we rewarding people? formally and informally? Um, and are we doing it around the brand and what it stands for and, and the character it's supposed to be living? What are our routines? What is our culture from a, a routine perspective? You can design all of these things in accordance with a top level strategy to make sure that it's um, being applied effectively. How are you reminding people of why they come to work and what the point of it all is? 
And that's becoming more and more challenging, isn't it, as we get a little bit, you know, we don't all come to one place often. We're, we're working remotely. So final one is to embrace innovation. Because the truth is, is that we can't stay the same. We have to move um, to a new place that is, that is highly designed around the consumer. We've got to differentiate ourselves, particularly if we want to stop competing on price. You know, we, we can get, get commodity-based stuff from anywhere, can't we? But, but what, what, what's the difference between buying one of, one, one, a commodity from over here and a commodity from over here? Often, it's the story, it's the narrative, it's the brand. It's, it's what that thing will make me become or, or make my identity with. And so it's not just that, though. It's, it's also then, how do I interact with that brand? What's my experiences as I go through it? So the key thing is to design your customer. Who do we really serve? What do they want to become? How can we make them stronger? Why should they care? And so market segmentation, you know, I'd suggest, is, 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 is a bit of a false economy sometimes. Because we say, we've got this huge market. Yeah, but in that market, who are we actually trying to serve? And what if that market doesn't even exist yet? What if we're here to serve a particular type of people with a particular belief system? We get scared of new things. And fear is the number one enemy of innovation. And so what I'd say is you've got to take those tools, you've got to apply them to all these things because creating real meaning is, is the key to the future. We all have stuff, but what we need is more meaning in our lives. That's what we're prepared to pay a little bit more for. That is what we, we want. We want that story to go with uh, as consumers and as employees. Mediocrity will not work, I would suggest to you. So there we go, three tools. Three strategies that you can, you can ho hopefully use to maybe think a little bit more differently about your business, about your brand, about your story. And so I just leave you with, with one kind of final thought, which is I hope these things have helped you to, to think about your meaning. And ladies and gentlemen, we really do need, if we're going to survive in the 21st century, if we're going to progress, if we're going to grow as organizations and as people, we need to manage our meaning. We need to give real thought to this.